here at the World of Wellness. Uh, I'm closing in on 15 years of experience with this group. And uh, um, I've been here when it was the uh, um, Weiner Wellness Center. And I predated the Weiner Wellness Center. And I was here when it was the uh, same group, different location, different name. It was the pain release clinic on the south side. So, so I go back a while. And occasionally, I have patients who come in who uh, we talk about the south side location and what a different world that is. And now we're in a, uh, um, a freestanding building in Green Tree. Um, last south neighborhood in pittsburgh uh first south suburb depending on your perspective and our building is thousands and thousands of square feet uh most of it is nutrition store uh state-of-the-art nutrition store great great products uh do you a world of good um but i practice chiropractic and my my scope is hands-on uh i do a combination of chiropractic adjusting the high velocity low amplitude chiropractic adjustment that occasionally generates popping noises. Not always, occasionally. I love that noise. Um, I do a little bit of trigger point muscle therapy. Uh, um, I'm not as good at it as Andrea, our, our muscle therapist, or some of the guys who've worked here in the past and have moved on to other, uh, other areas of life. But I do trigger point muscle therapy. And I also do a technique called uh, PNF, proprioceptive neurofacilitated stretching, also known as AIS, active isolated stretching. And, and I, I started incorporating more and that more and more of that technique into my routine because, first of all, it's synergistic of everything that I do. Uh, second of all, I did a program at the University of Pittsburgh called the Primary Spinal Practitioner, the first program in the country of its kind, which put chiropractors and physical therapists in the same classroom uh, working together, sharing common interests, common scopes of practice, uh, teaching and learning with one another. So anyhow, I, I started using that technique more and more after that specific program. And, and yesterday we had a, um, an in-depth conversation about really the nuts and bolts of what I do and of course the why. And the techniques that I use, my clinical methodologies, what, I, what I'm looking for is dysfunction in the human body. And by dysfunction, what I mean is uh, altered or aberrant push-pull relationships between muscles and the skeleton uh, with the related connective tissue involved. Um, how is the spine moving? Not necessarily are bones out of place or in place, but does the spine move in the pattern that it's supposed to? Uh, um, how about the feet? Do they move in such a way that they can behave as shock absorbers? Or do they move in such a way that there are cinder blocks that create more pounding than necessary that the rest of your body is going to have to account for and absorb that impact? And, and using those movement gauges, that's where I make a determination of which muscles I want to do some trigger point with, what I want to stretch, which joints, be it spine or extremity, what, uh, which adjustments I want to make. And, and the reason for making these adjustments and doing these maneuvers is what we want to do is we want to influence the brain. We want to restore the way the body and the brain are talking to one another. And let's think about the brain as a relay station in the sense that body movements will send information into the brain as to where the body is in space. And the brain will in turn interpret that and release natural endorphins and natural encephalons and help you feel good. Whereas a stuck body, uh, the brain is going to perceive that as pain. Now, it's very important. We're talking about pain as being a brain-based phenomenon. And we learned this, we learned this actually during the Civil War, that there were patients, or I should say there were soldiers, who suffered batter, battlefield injuries. They ended up having legs or arms amputated. And then they went on to feel pain in body structures that no longer existed. Well, why is that? That's because we learned that pain is a function of how your brain is perceiving the environment. So basically, our clinical practice here, that's myself and uh, Dr. Philip Ross, my colleague, what we're looking to do is influence the way the body is sending messages into the brain so that we can intercept the noxious stimuli, so that we can steer the brain into a pattern of releasing feel-good chemicals and not perceiving pain. So far, so good? Questions, comments, moral outrages? Okay, so... I got to give a couple of shout outs and acknowledge some people and some things. First of all, we have IT savant Phil over here to my right. You can't see him on screen, but he's very much present and he's 
monitoring the technology and making this workshop and actually all the workshops we have this week possible. Um, we have, uh, because of Facebook and YouTube and we've been on Zoom before and because of the computer uh, new age stuff, modern era stuff, we reach audiences all over the country, perhaps even all over the world. I, uh, um, I'm lucky to be making this presentation here in our Green Tree office. And we actually do have people physically present, listening in, paying attention to me. And I'm thrilled that they're here. And I'm also thrilled to be speaking to people remotely. So anyhow, thanks to IT Savant Phil for making that happen. My second big shout out is going to be for the uh, Pro Reds. <laughs> um, I'm a pretty strong guy. I mean, I get through my day doing physical work. I can't wait to go home tonight so I can work out and repeat the whole thing tomorrow. And, and I, I participate in underground fight club. I can't talk about that. Um, I'm strong, but my voice is not, my throat gets parched. So I have a great affinity towards water. I, I believe that's really the best drink you can drink. And spiking it with the uh, red superfood does nothing but enhance it. So those are those are my two major shout outs to begin with. Yesterday, when we talked about brain based pain and certain things that we can do from a chiropractic perspective, uh, um, what I can do for you clinically, what Dr. Phil can do for you clinically in terms of changing your biomechanics, changing the way your body moves, helping you to turn your body into a single unique system moving uh, uh, with itself rather than a collection of parts dragging itself along. Uh, big shout out for me yesterday to talk about the things that we can do. But today the big shout out is gonna mostly be for you guys because the scope of today's talk is what are the kind of things that you can be doing for yourself? How can you take action on your own behalf, maybe a little bit of self-empowerment uh, um, to enhance your own health? Now. Before we get rolling with that, let's talk about health for a second. Everybody comes here because they want to be healthier. They want to learn strategies to safeguard their health that they uh, currently possess. Uh, they want to regain their health. I don't know if we've ever really actually defined what it means to be healthy. So I want to remind everybody out there that this is, a, this is participation. Uh, if you're tuning in from a, a different city or from a different country or a different state or from your laptop down the road, you're welcome to join in. And you can just simply do that by uh, making good use of the comment box. And IT Savant Phil will let me know uh, what anybody wants to say or ask or uh, what they want to share. Uh, the people sitting here watching, you're certainly welcome to ask questions, answer questions, participate in any way you feel like. Uh, um, I've been at this a long time and nobody has thrown anything at me yet. So I'm hoping you won't be the first, but you know, if need be, go for it. So anyhow, let's talk about health. My definition of the word health is having the ability to recognize, interact with, adapt to, and overcome your environment, both internally and externally. So our internal environment is our brain chemistry, our neurochemistry, our biochemistry, the, uh, the hormones that we release, the enzymes that help us digest our food, the proteins that help us build, rebuild our bodies, uh, um, our ability to have a, a conversation. It's a product of what's going on with our internal chemistry that allows us to do these things. So, if you're going to put nourishment into your mouth in the form of a big kahuna burger, my, uh, uh, my suspicion is you're going to feed yourself chemistry, which is going to negatively impact your biochemistry, which is going to cause effects, undesired consequences, maybe some fatigue, maybe some poor digestion. Uh, um, maybe it'll influence your heart rate or your blood pressure in a direction that you don't want it to go. In contrast, if you're drinking water with delicious Pro Red spiked in, you're probably going to influence your um, internal chemistry, your internal environment in a way that we're going to shift it towards what's called homeostasis or normalcy, or we're going to turn our internal environment 
into a, uh, a better functioning, uh, a better functioning machine. How about our external environment? Well, that's everybody and everything around us, me, you, my external environment right now, the people who are tuned into my lecture, physically present, the fact that I'm standing here at this table and we're going to get to why I decided to stand instead of sit uh, shortly. Uh, um, we got the big window here to my right. We got the shades pulled down so that the glare doesn't affect my vision or doesn't affect the way I show up on camera. That's control of the external environment. If, if IT savant Phil decided to walk over to the window shade and pull it up and we had all this brightness uh, flowing through the room, it, it would be nice, but it, it would disrupt the way my image comes across on the camera, disrupting what you're seeing on, the, uh, um, on your computer screen. And that's how we're going to control our external environment is by keeping that screen down. So far, so good. All right. So we're talking about very briefly about chiropractic adjustments. We're talking about stretching muscles, about muscle therapy, about how we uh, um, adjust the extremities, uh, mobilizing the, uh, um, the skeleton, stretching and loosening up the muscle, muscle system in order to get the brain to, uh, um, to fire at a high enough frequency to suppress pain. Now, I'm really not a big name dropper. I like to talk about my friends and my mentors and uh, um, the people who I trained under. And I talk about them with a great sense of pride that these people are fantastic and I'm part of their organization. So I'll mention my mentors. And now at this point in my career, even my mentees, I'm not going to tell you about patients by name or by uh, identity. Uh, very, very guarded about my, the, uh, very guarded about the privacy of uh, the people that I treat. But I have, a, uh, um, I have a new mentee named Matthew Chase, and he did a great job of illustrating exactly what I'm getting about in terms of how profound it is to treat patients with multimodal, te multimodal techniques. Matthew's actually a student intern, so he's in the infancy stages of his career treating patients, and he had a patient who uh, suffered from migraines. Now... We typically think about migraines as being a, a really intense headache localized in the, in the head somewhere, probably. That's where the patient would perceive the pain. Uh, uh, but we talked about how the pain, whether we're talking about an amputated leg that uh, is still feeling the pain, that's no longer the leg might not be there, but we're still feeling pain there versus a migraine. Either way, we're still talking about a brain-based phenomenon. And a typical chiropractic uh, protocol is, well, let's look at the joints of the neck. Let's look at the neck and the upper thoracic, the top of the mid back, uh, as being the source of why this person is having migraines. And, and maybe, maybe that's right. Maybe that's a very accurate place to look. And maybe that's exactly what's going on. And by adjusting those areas, we're able to suppress the patient's, uh, brain's ability to feel that pain and the patient walks away feeling good. But what if, what if it's not enough? What if, what if the chiropractor makes adjustments and does a little bit of muscle work in those areas, but is unable to help the patient solve their migraine problem? That happens. Matthew, one of my mentees, was treating such a patient who'd been to a number of different practitioners, including chiropractors, and wasn't getting any kind of relief. Having an understanding of the neurology involved, Matthew went an extra layer deeper and he adjusted this patient's feet in the context of what are we going to do to stimulate the brain to suppress the migraine. And guess what? It worked. And now Matthew is a hero to that patient. What he did was he used other body parts that weren't supposedly involved in the problem as tools to influence more neurological stimulus in order to calm the brain down to release more pain. So that's the perfect illustration of what it is, what the people who practice and who teach in my paradigm do, and how we, uh, uh, how we behave towards our patients. Now, am I saying that migraines can be cured by uh, uh, adjusting people's feet? Well, first of all, I never use the word cure. We're not really curing anything. We're helping guide the patient towards some sort of relief. Second of all, I don't know. 
I think that there are probably a lot of patients out there who have very severe headaches, including migraines, that can be helped enormously through yeah. chiropractic application to their neck, shoulders, upper back, and gain a lot of relief through those treatments. But for the ones who don't, what I'm absolutely saying is, yes, there's a lot of neurological implication that comes from the feet. So let's not ignore them, regardless of what a patient's chief complaint might be. So people who, uh, uh, who tease me around here pick on me for two things. One is by the time this, uh, this workshop is over, I'm going to have a cute little red mustache from the reds that I'm drinking. And second of all, someone once asked for my lecture notes. This is it. I have a little index card with a few key words. So if you see me glancing down, I'm making sure that I don't leave anything out for you. Okay, so we talked about uh, uh, most of what we did in great detail and in depth yesterday. And there are two more things that I, I think are very important that I add to my, uh, um, my chiropractic protocols and the things that I do with my patients. Number one on the list that we have not yet mentioned are the prehab slash rehab exercises. I don't like to use a lot of fancy equipment. The most complicated thing I might ask a patient to use in terms of an exercise device is a shower towel. Uh, uh, as it turns out, we actually have shower towels here. We're uh, in partnership with a company that does shower towels and bath towels and hand towels infused with silver, which means that they're antimicrobial. Uh, um, so I know where you can get a good shower towel. Another complicated piece of equipment that I might suggest people use is ice. If you don't have any, I'll give you the recipe. It's not complicated. I can, I make my own, but uh, you can too. So I like body positions. I like moving the body through space in ways that reinforce treatment, that reinforce good posture, that reinforce good breathing mechanics. I love the nutritional supplements. I, I, I just... Man, to look over at our nutrition store and see the shelf after shelf of just the highest quality product that, that anybody could possibly have, like what, a, what an advantage that is to be able to treat patients and have that at your disposal and to be able to make recommendations of products that are just such high caliber and, and to have the, uh, the pro reds on top of everything else. But one, there really isn't any supplement whatsoever that is going to correct human biomechanics. That's a mechanical problem, and it has to be solved mechanically, through a, preferably through a chiropractor, preferably through one of the chiropractors that works here. But physical therapists, athletic trainers, massage therapists, trigger point therapists, the list goes on. There are a number of different professions, a lot of people who can help you with that. But if you want to solve mechanical problems and you want to get the joints of your body to move the way that they're supposed to and you want to get the muscles to stretch the way that they're supposed to. And you want those joints and those muscles to send positive information into the brain to influence the brain to release feel good uh, endogenous opioids, the opioids that your body produces, not the opioids that you get through a prescription or on a street. Then you really have to have mechanical treatment. But in terms of releasing inflammation, in terms of, of allowing tight muscles to stay in a relaxed state. Man, what, what a great place to practice with the nutrition that we have available here. However, every single metabolic process that goes on in the human body is oxygen dependent. If you want to be able to take advantage of all the nutrition that you put into your body in the forms of both food nutritional supplements, what have you, proprietary blends, vitamins, minerals, you have to be a good breather and you have to get enough oxygen into your body in order to literally fuel your own metabolic pumps to keep your brain running at a high threshold to, uh, um, to circulate through your body and to populate all your cells with oxygen to use as a critically important ingredient to turn nutrition into energy. So one of, the, one of the most important exercises that I teach my patients, whether they're rehabbing a sprained ankle, whether they're rehabbing a, a, a strained shoulder, uh, whether they're just say, hey, Orba, can you give me a couple strategies of things I can do for myself that'll make me healthier, give me 
better ability to recognize, adapt, to overcome my environment, both internally and externally. I would have to say somewhere near the top of the list is breathe deepest to your fullest capacity. So this is the point in the conversation where I've, I've given IT Savant Phil a shout out. I've given the Pro Reds a shout out. I've given myself one. I've given, how egotistical is that? Sorry. I've given the products that we carry in this store a big shout out. But now it's time to give you guys, my, my audience, a shout out because you're going to take a very little bit of action and it's going to pay enormous dividends for you guys to just simply do better. So what I'd like you to do is join me. What we're going to do is we're going to work on a few deep breaths and work on a, a breathing exercise together. So I'd like everybody to just sit up straight and we're going to breathe using our diaphragms. These muscles right up here in the front of my neck and the top of my chest, these are called the accessory muscles of respiration. And what they do is they attach to the top of the rib cage and to the collarbone, and they act as a pulley system and lift up. And there's certainly a time and a place for that. We need those muscles, but we don't want them to initiate the action of, of breathing because what happens is they become tight and they fatigue relatively quickly, and, and then they start to, to spasm and start to draw inflammation and they start to inhibit the way the joints of the rib cage and the bottom of the neck and the top parts of the spine and even the shoulder blades move. And then we start to get that sequela of events stranding information into the brain that indicates a quality of stuckness, not the quality of free movement, will result in pain, discomfort, and, and the list of the events just go on and on. So what we want to do is we want to ignore these muscles when we breathe. And we want to use our diaphragm muscle, which is really the top of our abdomen, the bottom of our chest. So if you, if you take your fingertips and you just trace down your, your breastbone, your sternum, and you come to the end at the bottom, you'll find a little piece that's the place that's tender on most people. It's a little piece of cartilage. And just below that piece of cartilage, we have our diaphragm muscle, which really like if you, if you cut somebody in half this way, and peel off the top of their torso and look down, you'll see the, uh, um, you'll see the diaphragm muscle. So it grows, it grows through you like we're going to cut a tree to count rings to determine how old the patient the part of the tree is. That, um, that's how we're going to find the diaphragm. So let's not, let's not do any violence to ourselves or to anybody else, but let's just appreciate where our diaphragm muscle lives. And what we want to do is we want to use that muscle as a pump. And we're going to use the diaphragm to create a pressure vacuum inside of our torsos, which is going to allow for our lungs a chance to expand and compress as we breathe. So what we want to do is we want to inhale and we want to suck in as much delicious oxygen as we can through our noses. So what we're going to do is we're going to keep our torso relatively still. And as we inhale, we're going to feel our chests and our abdomens expand. I'm pumping myself up with delicious oxygen. So I'm inhaling through my nose and I'm feeling my abdomen expand and my chest is expanding. And if you're in uh, uh, San Francisco, California, tuning in right now, and you can feel my chest pumping up against your computer monitor and, and you might be knocked over by me expanding this far as I'm inhaling, that means I'm getting it right. So I'm expanding, I'm holding. 1,001, 1,002, and I'm going to blow out through my mouth. Now, you'll notice I did not shrug my shoulders up when I took that deep breath. My shoulders rock backwards, almost like I'm pinching my shoulder blades behind my back. Not really a severe exercise, hard pinch, so much as I'm moving in that direction. So my chest is like a barrel expanding this way with my inhale, and I'm compressing by squeezing it in as I blow out through my mouth. So let's everybody make sure to do a couple of these together. Big deep breath in through your nose, feel your chest cavity expanding. Sorry for the people in San Francisco, California, if you feel yourself being pushed backwards by my expanding torso, we're still holding. And blow out through your mouths. All right, let's do that again. Big deep breath in. And we're holding and we're holding, and we're gonna hold some more, and we're gonna hold again, and blow out through your mouth. One more deep breath, this one's for you people in San Jose. We're expanding, expanding, expanding again. 
and blow out through your mouths. Okay, once again, this is interactive. So if you have any questions, comments, moral outrages, if you're disgusted, if you're now in a great mood, if you are, even if you're ambivalent, feel free to type into the, uh, uh, the Facebook chat box and, and share your thoughts, share your questions, what have you. If you're sitting in the audience and you have feedback or you have questions or you have any kind of sensation that you experience with a couple, three deep breaths now, you're welcome to share. Yes. Mm -hmm. Life and death. Yeah. That, that critically important. Yeah. As far as these beaters you can put on your thumb to measure oxygen mm -hmm. and heart rate. Mm -hmm. Is that, we're talking the same oxygen, uh, watering. Okay. Water. Okay. The question is, well, the question slash comment is about how important, how critically and vitally important oxygen is for the body. No, this is a life and death issue. If you don't have oxygen, you're not going to last long. And, and so the, the question was, this meter that you put on your finger or your thumb that measures the oxygen perfusion uh, through the body, presumably it's measuring how, how saturated you are with oxygen on a scale of zero to 100%. And I remember in terms of uh, going to people's offices, and we even did this here uh, during COVID, we would measure people and we would see what their, what their oxygen level was. And our concern, I, I can speak for our clinic, but I, I, can't, I can't speak, I don't know what everybody else's priority or how they were using the tool is, uh, we, had a, we had a cutoff number, and we saw that if people, if their oxygen was, was below a certain point, and, and I, think it was, I think it was in the high 80s, I don't remember what it was, we asked them to just take off your mask, go out back, take a couple of deep breaths and, and, and let's try this again. So I don't know, I don't know how accurate that meter is like measuring on your finger. Is it, is it really accurate as to what's going on on your whole body? And I wouldn't, I wouldn't go to court and testify based on the information that I got out of the meter. I wouldn't say that somebody's life is in danger or somebody was in really good shape. And I wouldn't put a tremendous value on that but it was the best gauge that we had at the time and we knew that look there's there's a certain point where this just this just isn't good enough and and we're concerned about you now my answer is not to say like like there was a time there was a time when it's all it's all debatable i mean you can you can pick which science is is the science that you want to subscribe to and, and i like to stay out of the politics as much as possible but there was a time when it was obligatory to wear a mask in here, as well as other places. And, and whether, whether we agree with it or not, we're not going to do anything that would cause jeopardy for the business. So people wore masks. But we were very cognizant that depriving people of oxygen wearing their masks would lead to other health problems that, that could be, like, let's nip that in the bud, right? And that's exactly why we would just send people out into their own private area, just, just breathe and reset yourself. And we did, that. we did that based on the readings that we got on that little index finger measurement, whether that was right or wrong was the best we had. So I know I, know I did some good high quality rambling there. I hope I answered your question. Okay, good. All right, so we talk about deep breathing. The next thing we have to talk about in terms of rehab exercises and prehab exercises. Rehab, we all know, somebody is injured, they wanna rehabilitate themselves, they wanna be back to where they were, maybe even better off, right? Prehab, what's that? Well, life is a contact sport. You just don't know what's coming when, accidents happen, challenges happen. We all have repetitive movements in our lives, whether we're typing, whether we're leaning into the TV when we're watching, or the computer, or driving. Uh, maybe we fix something in a shop all day long. I don't know what it is, but we all have our own unique repetitive movements and, and, and that's traumatic to the body. And that those repetitive movements, no matter what they are, will alter our posture. The better our posture is, the better our mechanical parts work together as a group or in, uh, um, in unison 
the more we're, our bodies carry us around and they're not just a collection of parts that we drag. So what we want to do, the best way to uh, work on posture is to do good posture. So what I want to think about is like you go to the doctor's office and they measure you. Everybody wants to be just as maximally tall as possible. Whatever your height is, it is. But we want it to be it and not, we don't want to lose inches. So there's a point on the top of our head where there's our tallest, tallest point. And you're being measured and you're trying to stretch that point up as high as it'll go. So what we want to imagine is a little screw tied into that tallest point and there's a string coming down from the ceiling attached to that screw. So we're lifting our heads as high as we can with a, with a thought process on that, where's that point where I'm the tallest. The next thing we want to do is we want to take our shoulder blades and throw them back. So I'm not squeezing my shoulder blades together like I'm exercising the muscles along my sides of my spine so much as I'm just letting my shoulder blades come back and sink down and my shoulder blades, just like yours and everybody else's, have a point at the bottom and I'm trying to touch my belt with the bottom point of my shoulder blades. You think that's going to happen? Olympic gymnasts can't make that happen, but it's a good visualization for feeling your shoulder blades just sink down. The next thing that's going to happen is we're back to that little piece of cartilage that's probably tender on most people where the diaphragm muscle lives and then to our belt buckle. So in that region from our tender piece of cartilage diaphragm area to our belt buckle, we want to be as tall and as long as possible. So I'm stretching my abdomen, I'm sinking my shoulders and I'm picking my head up. Now, if you see uh, military people in formation, and they're just standing there waiting to march for instructions, for inspection, for whatever it is they're waiting for. And these guys are just standing there perfectly relaxed, perfectly still, just hanging out. You'll notice their posture. Long, tall in the abdomen, shoulders are back, head is up. All right, so it sounds a little bit complicated when I'm talking about it. But the truth is, this is really a very simple position and easy one to stand in. So if you're physically capable of standing up and you want to indulge me, go ahead and stand up. Let's do this together and let's just stand tall for a few seconds. Tall in the abdomen, shoulders are back and down, heads up. All right. For the sake of my people who are live and in person, you guys look all look extremely comfortable and relaxed. And it's a good thing because inspection is happening in 14 hours and you guys are just going to stand here until then. So far, so good. For the people at home, I hope you feel as good as the people here with me look. Now, as long as we're standing here in this posture, let's take a deep breath in through your nose. Shoulders are not shrugging up. They stay in that sunk position. Very good. Hold it for a little bit longer and blow out through your mouths. Wasn't that fun? Wasn't that easy? Let's do one more. Big deep breath in through your nose. Torso is expanding as it blows up like a balloon. Beautiful. Hold. Hold again. Blow out through your mouths. And have a seat, please. All right. So maybe this will be a rhetorical question. Maybe somebody wants to answer. But on a scale of 1 to 10, 1 being... I could do that in my sleep. I don't even have to think about it to do this. 10 being, I have to single-handedly move mountains without a shovel. It's that hard. On a scale of one to 10, how hard was that? How time consumptuous is this gonna be? I'm thinking, man, we're in the neighborhood of 1.5 to maximum. How hard would it be to just stand in ideal posture long enough to take three deep breaths and do that as often as you think about it. Maybe you'll do that two, ten, 10 times on one day. Maybe the next day you'll only do it twice. Maybe the day after you won't even think about it and do it at all. And then maybe the day after that you'll do it another 10. We're not counting. We're not keeping score. We're just trying to find a few moments in time where you're exercising your postural muscles, you're exercising your diaphragm muscles, you're breathing in a comfortable, relaxed position and just feeling good about it. 1.5, maybe 2 on a scale of 1 to 10, how difficult it is. You guys all on board with that? Questions, comments, moral outrages? Okay, a comment. I thought that part of the slide was associated with your hinge a lot. You know, for 
that? Yes. Uh, I imagine that you're referring to something that we talked about yesterday. And the fight or flight mechanism, uh, um, what we said was the cerebellum fires to inhibit the sympathetic nervous system. Um, well, the whole brain is associated with uh, the neurochemistry involved with the autonomic nervous system. But as the cerebellum fires, it decreases sympathetic output, leading toward uh, more of a parasympathetic, parasympathetic being your wine and dine, rest and digest uh, experience. Um, so we were talking about uh, not a strict A is associated with B so much as how do we inhibit this? What do we do to provide or to stimulate the system of checks and balances? And that was, that was something that we went into on much larger detail and drilled down on yesterday and just really barely even overviewed today. So the next thing I want to talk about is uh, um, our workstations, our work environments. You'll notice that I'm standing. I was standing for the talk yesterday. And that, that's because when, when COVID happened and we had such a large population of people who became work at home people and not go to the office, we had, we had people who had to figure out how to design their own workstations. And, and you know what, as comfortable as it might be on the short term, using your laptop in bed just isn't going to cut it. That's, that's going to cause more problems than solve. So uh, um, we came up with, and when I say we, I have 10, maybe 15 professional colleagues scattered around the country that I'm in pretty close contact with and talk to regularly. And we share the nuts and bolts of what we're doing with specific patients. And we run problems that we're stuck on by each other. And this group, my group, we just came up with a checklist of a few things that you can do to make your workstation more comfortable, more effective, be a more efficient person at your station. And, and the m number one thing on the list was when you sit, depending on your sitting posture, you're putting between 40 and 70% more increase of, of pressure on your spinal discs. So everybody sit up just a little bit straighter to, uh, uh, to preserve your discs. So we started advocating for a, a sit-stand uh, uh, workstation, a desk where you can rotate between I'm standing, this is the right height for me to be at my, uh, my laptop and to see my computer screen. Uh, I can lower it and move over to my chair and, and bounce back and forth between sitting and standing. So that was number one on the checklist. And, and I stood yesterday for my presentation. I'm standing uh, here today because I'm part of my uh, uh, do as I not don't just do as I say, but do as I do club. And then for the people who are uh, sitting at their workstations, there are a couple things that we want to be specifically conscious of. One is the light source. You certainly don't want to be working in the dark. You want to be conscious of where your windows are if you have natural light. You want to, if you have a light source overhead or you have lamps scattered around your workroom, you certainly want to position them in a place where they're effective, but the glare isn't bouncing off of your screen, uh, creating discomfort for you. As you, as you stare into a, a bouncing light source. And, and that's something that, that sounds kind of self-evident, but it turns out that we, uh, we ran into a lot of people who had an aha moment and moved their lamp over, or maybe they shifted their desk to get away from the light source overhead that they could take advantage of it without it blinding them on the computer. Uh, the next thing on our checklist was, we wanna make sure that the monitor itself is at eye level or maybe even, maybe just slightly above eye level, but certainly not below eye level. So what happens this way is that uh, we don't bring our heads down into this position or this postural configuration, but we're gonna keep our heads up uh, the whole time that we're looking at the monitor. And in order to position our bodies, if we are gonna be sitting at the, at the desk or sitting at our keyboards, we wanna have a 90 degree angle with uh, our, our feet, to our, uh, our shins. So that's gonna be 90 degrees. Then we're gonna have another 90 degree bend at our knees, and then another 90 degrees yet from our thighs to our waist up into our torso. And then we're gonna have 90 degrees at our elbows. I don't know if you can see me on the screen. 90 degrees here at our arms to our side to the, 
to the monitor. So that might mean that you need a taller chair or a shorter chair or depending on the ratio of how, how long my torso might be relative to how long my legs might be. Maybe I'm going to prop my chair up or, or smash my chair down just a little bit in order to maintain those in, the integrity of that 90-90-90 principle. So we had a, um, a number of other tips and tricks uh, uh, about making sure that you participate in all the uh, Zoom meetings that you might be at, even if it's just to say hello to assert the fact that you are present. Uh, we talked about taking uh, um, consistent breaks, uh, same time, this is, this is my work schedule, maybe even putting up a do not disturb sign on your door to your office space, your home office space, even if you're the only person living in that house, it might feel more professional to you to put up a, a do not disturb. We talked about the importance of having days where you dressed up like, I'm, I, I know I'm working from home alone, but today is still going to be a suit and tie day just to make sure that I keep that as part of my routine. So that was the, uh, that was the gist of, of building our own personal workspaces at home. Now, questions, comments, moral outrage is where we're at. We're good. Okay. Now, something else that I'm really interested in that, that I do with uh, patients really on rare occasion at this point that you probably do more often, but it's better in like a group presentation. And when I do this one-on-one, -on -one, it really takes over the whole appointment time. And we don't end up doing a lot of hands-on mechanical treatment because of, well, just I have a busy schedule and I got to keep to it. And can't turn 20 minute appointments into hour long appointments just to do these things. But something that I'm really interested in is called emotional freedom technique, EFT. There was a, uh, um, he was a psychologist named Roger Callahan who was working with uh, Vietnam combat vets in the, uh, I believe it was the later 1970s, maybe even into the early 1980s. And, and these guys were all, if they, if they were, out and about now, they would have been diagnosed as um, having PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorders, but uh, that diagnosis didn't exist in the time that uh, Dr. Callahan was working with these guys. So they're really, um, um, this group is not responding to therapy. They're really a group of very withdrawn people who are uh, fatigued, who are not interested in participating, who are becoming inactive who uh, uh, are literally shell-shocked. And, and Dr. Callahan's one of these people who's just, he's just interested in everything. And he came across studying this technique, which is actually based on acupuncture points. And it's a it's, shout out to you guys. This is something that you're going to do for yourself. Uh, um, this is a treatment that is self-applied tapping to acupuncture points in order to uh, recalibrate the way the conscious mind and the subconscious mind are talking to each other. Now, I'm interested in joint manipulations and joint mechanics and, and what are we going to do to get the certain aspects of the body to communicate with the brain. But there also have to be treatment modalities where we get the brain to communicate with itself, to get the conscious mind and the subconscious mind to link forces and, and help us better achieve an ability to recognize, interact with, adapt to, and even overcome our environments, both internally and externally. And that's, that's the definition for health, as, as far as I'm concerned. So what Dr. Callahan did was he started teaching this uh, emotional freedom tapping to his, his patient group, his, his group therapy of, of what are now known as PTSD people. And it was really the first breakthrough that anybody had with these groups and, and how in slow motion, albeit, this group of guys started to recover a little bit. So what I want to do is uh, um, I want to run through some emotional freedom tapping with you guys. So what I'd like you to do is just follow along with me. And once again, this is self-applied treatment. Now, what we do is we have to have we have to have a mantra. We have to acknowledge that there's some sort of a problem out there and we're going to overcome that problem and we're going to be just fine. So the mantra is even though blank, I deeply love and accept myself. Now I've had, uh, I, I did this in a, uh, um, I had, I did this in a, uh, um, a pre COVID world and we had a, a really crowded, crowded room and, and somebody brought up an excellent point. And, and he said that instead of saying, I deeply love and accept myself, 
they, they wanted to tur- turn this into a faith-based uh, statement. And they wanted to talk about, instead of saying, I deeply love and accept myself, they said something like, uh, this is God's plan for me. And if, if that resonates better for you, then go for it. The important thing is the tapping and that you're being reassuring with yourself. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this out loud, uh, uh, saying that I deeply love and accept myself simply because that's how Dr. Callahan did the maneuvers and that's how I learned it. But it's in no way, make, no way shape, or form meant to uh, uh, substitute for anybody's religious or spiritual beliefs. So you're just going to have to be true to yourself and be comfortable with your, who you are and what you're about. And that's, that's better than fine. Um, so because I had this conversation with a patient recently, and it's fresh in my mind as to where I want to go with this, the mantra that I'm going to say out loud is, even though I suffer from all this anxiety, I deeply love and accept myself. And, and if you want to roll along with me and say that, you go for it. And if you want to change the mantra to some other problem that you might have, or even though, even though my wrist hurts, I deeply love and accept myself. Even though my car is broken down and I can't afford to fix it right now, I deeply love and accept myself. That's all. That's better than fine. That, that absolutely works. But I'm, I'm following through with a conversation that's fresh in my mind. So the first place I'm going to go is going to be what's called the karate chop place. And for the sake of consistency, I'm going to use my right fingers to tap for the simple reason that I'm right-handed. You can go opposites. You can use your left if you prefer. And I'm going to tap on the left side of my body. So if I were going to, if I were going to do a karate chop and I were going to break a board, Let's think about what part of the bottom of my hand, the top of my wrist area, I would would want to make impact with that board with. So I'm using my index and middle finger, and I'm just tapping that spot where I would break that board. And the point that I'm looking for is really, really small, but my fingertips are wide. So even if it's by accident, I'm going to get the right point in here. And I'm just tapping, and I'm tapping, and I'm tapping some more. And what I'm going to say is, even though I have all this anxiety, I deeply love and accept myself. Even though I have all this anxiety, I deeply love and accept myself. And now I'm going to move from my karate chop point to that point where I want to be the tallest, where I would stretch my head up to reach the the top of the measuring stick. And I'm going to tap up there and I'm going to say, even though I have all this anxiety, I deeply love and accept myself. Even though I have all this anxiety, I deeply love and accept myself. And now I'm going to move from that point to the inside of my eye, where my eyebrow, my eye, and the top of my nose all meet. And I'm going to tap right there. Even though I have all this anxiety, I deeply love and accept myself. Even though I have all this anxiety, I deeply love and accept myself. And from here, I'm going to move to the outside of my eye, where my eyebrow, the outside of my eye, and the fleshy part of my skull right behind the top of my uh, eye socket meet. And I'm going to tap and say, even though I have all this anxiety, I deeply love and accept myself. Even though I have all this anxiety, I deeply love and accept myself. Now I'm going to come down to the six o'clock position right below my eye where soft fleshy tissue of my cheek comes to an end and my cheekbone and orbital socket become one and I'm tapping. Even though I have all this anxiety, I deeply love and accept myself. Even though I have all this anxiety, I deeply love and accept myself. And now I'm moving to the middle of my mustache. Right below, there's a, there's a piece of flesh that divides my two nostrils. I'm following it right down to that indentation where my mustache would be. And I'm tapping and I'm tapping some more. Even though I have all this anxiety, I deeply love and accept myself. Even though I have all this anxiety, I deeply love and accept myself. And now I'm going to drop down to below my bottom lip almost on a straight line down. Now I'm in this indenture between the top of my chin and the bottom of my lip, and I'm still tapping. Even though I have all this anxiety, I deeply love and accept myself. Even though I have all this anxiety, I deeply love and accept myself. Now I'm going to find the inside of my collarbone. The collarbone is this bone right here at the very top of your rib cage in front of your trapezius muscle. And I'm going to find the soft, fleshy spot where the uh, collarbone meets the, uh, the sternum. And I'm just going to keep tapping. Even though I have all this anxiety, I deeply love and accept myself. Even though I have all this anxiety, I deeply love and accept myself. 
Now I'm going to slide down in the seam from my armpit down to the bottom of my rib cage at approximately the, at approximately the height of that fleshy piece of cartilage at the bottom of the sternum where the diaphragm muscle that we talked about earlier lives. We're sliding across to the midline seam and I'm going to keep tapping index and middle finger, even though I have all this anxiety, I deeply love and accept myself. Even though I have all this anxiety, I deeply love and accept myself. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to move to my thumbnail. So I want to be on the place where well, on one side of my thumb, uh, I'm close to my index finger. On the other side of my thumb, I'm freely out in space. So I'm going to be on the out in space side of my thumbnail. And I'm just going to tap with those same two fingers uh, where the nail and the finger meet on the side. Even though I have all this anxiety, I deeply love and accept myself. Even though I have all this anxiety, I deeply love and accept myself. And now I'm going to do the exact same thing on the corresponding spot on my index finger where the nail meets the finger on the side of the finger that would be next to the thumb. Even though I have all this anxiety, I deeply love and accept myself. Even though I have all this anxiety, I deeply love and accept myself. And now I'm going to do the same thing on that same point on the middle finger. Even though I have all this anxiety, I deeply love and accept myself. Even though I have all this anxiety, I deeply love and accept myself. And now here comes the wrinkle. We're going to skip the ring finger and move to that same corresponding spot on the fifth finger. Even though I have all this anxiety, I deeply love and accept myself. Even though I have all this anxiety, I deeply love and accept myself. Now, we're going to move to a new point, which is going to be the fleshy musculature between the, the fifth finger and the ring finger. And I'm just going to keep tapping on this point. And I'm going to keep staring straight ahead, but I'm going to do it with my eyes shut. Now I'm going to open my eyes back up and I'm going to roll my eyes in a clockwise circle as I continue to tap. And now I'm going to roll my eyes in a counterclockwise circle while I tap. I'm going to continue tapping and I'm going to look down into my left and continue tapping and look down into my right. And I'm going to continue tapping and I'm going to count to 10, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And now I'm going to continue tapping and I'm going to hum the happy birthday song. <laughs> My neighbors threw me out for singing in the shower and relax. Okay, so for the people who followed, for the sake of the people who followed along and ran through the drill, you guys feel an energetic shift at all? Even just a little bit, maybe a little bit alert, maybe a little bit relaxed, rested, something. Okay, so I'm, I'm getting a few like nods of the head and an uh-huh, uh-huh. So anyhow, I, I book patients approximately, I, I spend approximately 20 minutes with a patient and I book patients every half hour. So there's a 10 minute swing. In that swing time, you know, somebody, traffic was tough, somebody came late. Uh, somebody had a new problem that we didn't account for and we went over time a little bit. It is what it is. That's just how the day unfolds. But when the day is going smoothly, I finish up with a patient. I have a few minutes left. I work on their notes while everything is fresh in my mind. And then I disappear in my office to either do a, a, a little few deep breaths with standing position with good posture. Maybe I do a little bit of the EFT tapping in order to recenter myself and look, the last person was the last person and we did some good work together, but now it's time to think about the next person. I got to be present and conscious for that individual. So that's how I employ the tapping in my own life. And that's how I employ the deep breathing exercises and the postural exercises. I built it into my schedule. I'm doing this multiple times every day. So what I'd really like is at some point in the future that whether I get an email or a Facebook message or somebody drops in and Maybe even somebody new schedules an appointment and they say, you know, I saw you on that uh, on that video uh, during wellness week when you talked about the importance of deep breathing and we talked about how to do it properly. And then we did that tapping and I've been doing it myself to a certain extent. And I was just wondering if you had any more tricks up your sleeve. And the answer is yes. Yes, I do have more tricks. My bag of tricks is not bottomless, but we got a long way to start digging to get to the bottom. So. With that, I want to thank you guys all for your very kind attention, for your participation, for being here, for caring about natural health, uh, for the people who wrote comments or wrote in. Is there, is there anything else? For the people who 
uh, asked questions and, and participated via the Facebook chat. Thank you all so much for your kind attention. Uh, I, I wish you all good health. I wish you all safety. And I hope to see you back at future wellness events and uh, um, 